Hello everyone. Welcome to the Saturday, September 12th Classroom 2.0 Live show. Today's topic is the featured teacher for September and our featured teacher is Matt Miller. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore is doing closed captioning for us. Thank you, Tammy, for doing closed captioning. I'm going to turn the mic over to Patty who will introduce Matt for us and ask him the newbie question. Hi everyone. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Matt Miller today. I first heard about Matt when he was a guest on Jeff Bradbury's TeacherCast podcast and he talked about his book Ditch That Textbook so I went right out and got it on my Kindle and wow it's great and I know he's going to have a wealth of ideas for us today. Matt launched into his textbook list path where learning activities were often custom produced for his students as well as infused with technology. He likes the results a lot and his students do too. He's a proud graduate of Indiana State University and he wants to say go Sycamores I'm sure and lives the dream. He's got a wife, three kids, a mortgage and two dogs. He has taught high school since 2004 ranging from all levels of Spanish to etymology, English, and yearbook. Before he became a teacher, he was a newspaper reporter, and he wrote for several Indiana daily newspapers, including the Indianapolis Star. Matt was awarded the Golden Apple Award by WTHI-TV in Terre Haute, Indiana, for being one of five outstanding educators in the Wabash Valley in 2014. He was also nominated for a BAMI Award for Secondary School Teacher of the Year in 2014. So we thank you so much, Matt, for being here. And we will kick it off by asking you to answer our newbie question. And our question is, what does Web 2.0 mean to you? And why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Well, hello everyone and thank you Patty for that, that wonderful introduction. So what does Web 2.0 mean to me? Well, when I first started teaching it was more like Web 1.0 where a lot of the things that we used in our classroom were real static. Um, there wasn't much interaction. It was just a lot of information just kind of posted out there, which was really big at the time. But now with Web 2.0 we're much more interactive and I think that's that's really important because I know for me a lot of my students use all of this rich media to interact with the world and interact with their friends and their families and I think whenever I can bring that into the classroom and I can do that in the classroom that just really brings education into their comfort zone into a place that they're already familiar with anyway and if we can do that kind of work in their comfort zone then they don't have to adapt to this different learning environment that is, is really foreign to them. And so that's kind of why I use Web 2.0 tools in my classroom also is it gives my students an, an opportunity to interact with each other, to collaborate and create things in the digital realm that they, they really couldn't do in the normal classroom. And then it also allows us to go outside of the four walls of our classroom and really connect with other classes and other students and other people, you know, potentially all over the world. And that's something that I want to talk a little bit about today. So that, that's kind of my rationale for all of that. So are we ready to jump into the presentation then? There it is. Okay. All right. So I think we're, we're off to the races here. So, um, so the, the title I've got on this says Creating Future Ready Students in Classrooms, which I think is so important. And to, to get us started, I thought that we might have a couple of little quiz questions. So if you're familiar with Kahoot, um, Kahoot is this great tool that you can use to basically turn your questions in the classroom into almost like a game show. And so I'm not actually going to do a full live Kahoot during this session, much to the chagrin of probably some of you out there. Um, but I am going to use Kahoot sort of as a, as a jumping off point to ask you some questions just to kind of get things kicked off. So if we can use that, um, 
we could we could even use the same um, voting tool that we used for the the earlier questions, or you could even type your answers into the chat if you want, or if you want to, you can just kind of think in your mind what you think the right answers are. So just some things to kind of get our our brains going here. And so here's our first question: By 2020, what percent of the labor force will be age 55 or older? This is just to kind of illustrate how the workforce is changing, how our world is changing. So is it 14 percent? We'll call Let's say 14% is A, let's say 65% is B, 25% is C, or 80% is D. So make your best guess, 14% A, 65% B, 25% C, 85% D. Go ahead and make your guesses either over here in the participant panel or over here in the chat. Let's wrap that up in about five, four, three, two, one. They're kind of all over the board. It looks like we're leaning towards B, and guess what? The answer is C. 25% of the labor force will be age 55 and older. As we get more and more and more children born, our ages in the workforce are getting younger and younger. We've got a bunch of baby boomers that are getting ready to retire. So. Interesting stuff, right? All right, this is all, by the way, um, based off of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I, I pulled this all from there. So, all right, let's go on to our next question. In 2020, how many women will be new economic contributors in the world economy? How many women will be new economic contributors in the world economy? Would that be A, 100,000, B, 100 million, C, 1 million, D, 1 billion. In 2020, how many women will be new economic contributors in the world economy? A, 100,000, B, 100 million, C, 1 million, B, sorry, D, <laughs> 1 billion. All right, let's wrap those up. I'll flip the screen in 5, 4, 3, 2, one. The answer is one billion. And if you think about all of our third world countries, that's where a lot of this growth, I'm reading that that's, that's where a lot of this growth is coming, is you're getting a lot of women who used to be in those traditional roles and they're starting to become new economic contributors, working in jobs that, that weren't available to them, that kind of thing. So pretty interesting, huh? All right, so let's go on to the next question. We have two more. I think it's two. By 2020, what percent of the global population will live in cities and suburbs? What percent will live in cities and suburbs across the globe? 45% is A. 72% is B. Did we need to reset those options? There we go. Okay, so if you, if you voted on this one, vote again. A is 45%, B is 72%, C is 60%, and D is 97%. What percentage of the global population will live in cities and suburbs? This is an interesting one to me because I live currently in a very, very small town and I'm getting ready to move out in the country in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so this one actually doesn't apply to me. All right, let's wrap those up in five, four, three, two, one. Correct answer is C, 60% will live in cities and suburbs. So we're, we're continuing to get more and more urbanized. People keep coming to the centers of the, the cities. So, all right, last question. In 2020, how much data will the world generate in a single year? Would that be A, 35 gigabytes, B, 35 zettabytes, C, 35 terabytes, or D, 35 yottabytes? I do have to say, if you've never heard of yottabytes before, if you think you know what that sounds like, it was actually named after that. We're talking about yoda, like Y-O-D-A. They actually named that that figure after Yoda. So go ahead and get your go ahead and get your votes in there. 
five, four, three, two, one. And your answer is 35 zeta bytes. So we're very familiar with gigabytes right now. Terabytes are starting to come in. So here's what a zeta byte is. A zeta byte is equal to a billion terabytes. So a terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes, 1 billion zeta bytes. Can you imagine that? That's crazy. <laughs> All right. So anyway, hope that hopefully that's been been fun for you. You've enjoyed our our little game to get things kicked off anyway. Yeah, so the world is changing, isn't it? Changing pretty quickly. Oh, looks like I had one more question. I think I'm just going to skip past it if that's okay. All right, so the workforce is changing. Here's the, the sad thing that I'm starting to come across the more that I visit schools and the more that, that I continue to work in one. The workforce is changing, but schools by and large are not. We are so steeped in our tradition, and we're so steeped in our old teaching practices, we're not really changing a whole lot. Sometimes you see people talk about my parents' education or my grandparents' education. And honestly, if you look around at classrooms these days, we still have rows of seats directed to the front with a board, maybe a whiteboard now instead of a chalkboard. A lot of things really don't, haven't changed a whole lot. And they really need to. And here's why. Because we're preparing students for jobs and technology that haven't been created yet. I've seen this said before, and I, it just it makes me really stop and think every time I see it that we really are. We have, I mean, look at all the jobs that are available out there right now. Think about social media marketing specialists. That job just wasn't even conceivable back when I started teaching just what, a little over 11 years ago. And so this is, this is the world that we're trying to prepare our students for. So how do you hit a target that you can't see? So we have to, we have to do our best to prepare them for, the, for those skills that, that are going to serve them regardless of what the future looks like. Now I'm, I'm always working to try to bridge that gap in my, in my own classroom. So I want to tell you a little bit about that and give you a little glimpse into, into my world. So this is my family. That's obviously me over to the left. And my family very much is an education family. So here's, here's what's great. If, you, if you're looking at the background, yes, that is on the teacups at Disney World. I'm wondering you might be able to say in the chat if you've ever been, been there before. But that was, that was a picture. It was not while the ride was going. We took that picture before the ride started. <laughs> so um, my wife, right next to me, her name's Melanie. She's a junior high social studies teacher. And we both uh, have taught at the same junior, senior high school. And so last year what was nice is I could walk down the hallway during my prep period and kind of peek in and see what she was up to in her classroom. And then the other nice thing about being in small schools is that my three kids, in the middle is Hallie. She's a second grader this year. Next to her is Cassie. She's a fourth grader. And on the end is Joel. And he's in kindergarten this year. And the other thing about being in, an, in a small school that's really nice is that our junior senior high school was attached at the cafeteria to the elementary school. So we would all ride in in the mornings. And so during my prep, I could go down and I could peek in on my wife's class and then I could go down to the cafeteria and go hug Hallie and Joel and within five minutes, Cassie would come in for lunch and I'd get to hug her too and then go back and still have a half hour left in my prep period. So. The beauties of small schools, it was, it's, it's been a, a, pretty, a pretty blessed experience for us when it comes to that. So, All right, so anyway, let's move on to the classroom. I hate to say this, but it is, it is totally true, and I'm willing to admit it, that I was a pretty crummy teacher when I very first started teaching. I taught very traditionally, I was a high, a high school Spanish teacher, so I um, have taught high school Spanish for 11 years, and when I very first got started, it was a lot of activities out of the book, questions at the end of the chapter, worksheets, workbooks, that kind of thing. And so I'm going along teaching that way for a couple of years, and I start to develop this secret that I wished that and I hoped that my fellow teachers and my principal would not find out. And so here's what that secret was. I'm going to tell you what that secret was. My secret was that my Spanish students, my high school Spanish students, couldn't speak Spanish. It was sad. 
because we did all of these activities out of the class and I was, I mean, that's, that's sort of how I learned how, how to, how to teach, or that's how I learned Spanish when I was in high school and so that's kind of, kind of what I did and it really didn't work very well and so I want to introduce you to my path to textbook liberation. So this was when I started to ditch my textbook. This was about six years ago or so. And so here are the circumstances that kind of went around that. So here's the, the first part of it. I'm in class, I think it was Spanish 2 that I was, when I, when I had this, this moment, and I was giving a riveting lecture on reflexive verbs or the subjunctive mood or something like that. Yeah, riveting, <laughs> right? And so here I am up front, lecture, 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 talking. You can see on my little sketch there, it says boring grammar on the chalkboard. And there are my students. They're checked out. They're not paying attention. And so I'm like 30 minutes solid into this lecture and I finally am done. And I have an activity for, for them to, um, to work on. <laughs> Eli says, y se uh, Yeah, yeah, they got very bored. <laughs> and so here we are 30 minutes in and I give them opportunity to work on, a, to work on a assignment. And of course they're totally checked out. They're not interested in this one little bit. And so, they're not doing their assignment and being sort of an, a new teacher still at that time, my first instinct, my, the first emotion that came out of me was anger because I didn't have control of the class and I couldn't make them do exactly what I wanted. And so here's what happened next. I'm looking at them and I'm going, oh, so, so you guys have all of this, this extra time, huh? Not working on your assignment, huh? That must mean that you're all done. Well, guess what? If you've got all this extra time, all this free time on your hands, I'm giving you more homework. And that didn't go over very well, as you can imagine. So they were angry and they grudgingly got out their, their books and they started working on their assignments. And so the end of the class comes, the bell rings, and these students are literally running for the door. I mean, running like somebody pulled the fire alarm running. Like, like somebody said that Taylor Swift was set up in the cafeteria signing autographs, kind of running, if you can imagine what that would be like. And so basically, I mean, what I was doing there was I was trying to punish them with the very concepts that I wanted to get them excited about. It was about the worst possible strategy that you could imagine. And so I watched them run for the door like this and I'm going, this is not what I signed up for. This isn't who I want to be as a teacher. This isn't who I, this isn't what I want my class to be. And so I knew something had to change. And so here I am two weeks later and I'm doing basically the same thing. I'm not sure why I did the same thing, but I just, I didn't know what else to do. And I'm looking around at my students and they're still so totally bored, totally bored. And I'm going, it cannot get any worse than this. And so I've been thinking about it over those, those weeks. And I thought, if it can't get any worse, I got to try something different. And so here's where, where we went. I went to the back of my room and there were these seven foot tall wooden cabinets and I opened one of them up. <laughs> it happened to be one of my three cabinets that actually had a little bit of space. The rest of it was crammed full of junk. I bet you guys probably can't sympathize with that at all, can you? <laughs> and so, um, so basically, I, I go to the back of the room and I say, okay, you guys, I've had enough your textbooks go in here. And so here they come filing back, kind of looking at me out of the corner of their eye, wondering what in the world's going on, looking around at each other going like, are we in trouble? Did we do this? And so honestly, it wasn't them at all. It was me. And so I'd like to say after that happened that it was all sunshine and puppy dogs and rainbows and everything, but it really wasn't. So here's what happened to me next. There I am going, what in the world was I thinking? Why in the world did I just do that? And so it was a mess. It was a mess for a little while, but we, we started, I mean, shocking. I started talking to my students in Spanish more instead of doing things out of the book. Imagine that as a, as a strategy for trying to teach students Spanish. And we started going online. We started creating things with Google Docs and started looking up authentic resources on the web. Like if we were, practicing with the vocabulary of the house. What we would do is we'd go on online and we would find classified ads that actually use those words. And things started to slowly get better. And 
at the beginning of the year, I would stand at the door and I would ask something very simple to them as they walked in the door, like, como estas? Como estas means how are you? And usually what would happen is they would kind of look at the floor and like hurry past me <laughs> and go sit down at their, their desk and cover their face up and be like, I hope he doesn't talk to me in Spanish again. I hope he doesn't talk to me in Spanish again. <laughs> and so at the, end of the, at the end of the year, they finally start talking to me little by little more and more in uh, just spontaneous Spanish until eventually here's where we are. I have a student that might be able to say something like, yo puedo hablar español mucho mejor que antes. I can speak Spanish much better than I did before. And so there's me going, yes. So, so basically, that's, that's kind of how it all came around. And I'd like to say after that experience that I have it all figured out and everything is good and I can tell you exactly how to teach a high school Spanish class without textbooks and that it would be perfect. But I'm evolving and improving just like all the rest of us are. And so I'm, I'm changing things and trying to get better day by day. So, so anyway, there it is. That's the whole thing, <laughs> my path to textbook liberation. So I want to share with you today three ways to ditch your textbooks. Now, if you're wondering the, about this whole ditch that textbook thing, this doesn't mean that I actually got an email from somebody today and she's going, I'm not sure if you hate textbooks or if you think that we shouldn't use them. So let me clarify. I don't hate textbooks and I know that in some situations they are vitally necessary and some teachers have to teach by them based on, um, based on school, what, what the school says. But I just really feel like here in the 21st century, we can do so much better than going mindlessly from chapter to chapter, activity to activity, page to page, and can get outside of the textbook and just get creative, incorporate some technology, do some other things. And so I want to show you some, some, some of the big things that have really helped my, my teaching by getting outside of the textbook. And so here's number one. Number one is to get organized. And so when I started getting online more and my students started creating things digitally more, we had all of these links and all of these web pages and all of these resources and different things and they were all over the place and I didn't have one good place for them. And so what I did to help that out some was I got onto Weebly. And if you've never heard of Weebly before, it's basically a website that lets you create websites. And so if you've never created a website before, um, Weebly really is an easy way to do it. And so I want to actually take you out to, let's see if I can do this correctly. Peggy was trying to teach this to me. I hope that I get it right. Okay, hopefully now you can see what it looks like to design a Weebly website. This is actually my class website. And so, um, I want to show you how easy it is to create things here. So let's actually go off to a page that I don't use as much. We'll go off to this projects page. And so if you want to create a website, uh, creating a Weebly account is just as easy as creating a new email account. So it's, it's really pretty easy. And then if you want to add things to these different pages, you can create this little this set of tabs up here by creating pages with this, this one up here. And on each page, you can add a new title, you can add a new text box, a picture, whatever just by clicking and dragging it over onto the page. And so there's a title. Here's a text box. Hopefully my, hopefully the video is keeping up with what I'm, what I'm saying to you. And so all you have to do is just click in here and type in your text and you've got it. And then once you're done, you hit this publish button up at the top and it's done. And so that's really as easy as it is to create your own website. And that's all that I did. I created a website one page for each class and then I just started filling in, I just started filling in the pages with, um, with all the content that we were going to do. And so that, that basically became practically my digital ever evolving textbook. All of the information, actually I want to show you my, my class website. So we're going to go back out again. And so, all of my information, I'm going to take you to a Spanish one page here. All the information that my students were responsible for was all on this web page. Let's see if I can make it a little bit. Oh, I think that was, let's see if I can zoom in just a little bit here, make it easier to see. 
Oh, it's getting smaller. <laughs> now I think it's going to get bigger. There it goes. Okay, so anyway, you can see up here at the top it says Unit 7 Week 1 Study Guide. And that's just a link to a Google document. So I would pull all the information that they were responsible for together in this Google document. And so it would be, you know, Spanish a lot of times world languages is highly focused on vocabulary, grammar structures, and culture. And so they'd click on this and they'd be able to go off and see that Google document with those parts that they're required to do. I could give them some instructions. This was right here for a day that I missed and there was a sub there. I just put the instructions on the class website. This is another tool that was really nice to have on my class website. It's, if you're familiar with Quizlet, it's a place where you can make online flashcards. And so I would just embed the Quizlet flashcard set onto my website so kids could actually come through and flip the pages or flip the cards and be able to practice their practice their vocabulary terms right there. And so all I did was I just kept adding text onto this. I could add some pictures. Let's see if I can, there are some pictures right there. These are, um, I like to do storytelling in my class. Uh, so we'll use the vocabulary and the grammar for that given week. And I'll pull my students in. A lot of these stick figures are actually my students. And so we'll tell these crazy, ridiculous stories. And my students get to be the stars of the stories. And we practice all of the, we practice all of the different um, vocabulary and grammar structures based on that and draw it onto the board. It's a lot of fun. So, um, so anyway, that's how I use my class website to be almost like my digital textbook. So, uh, so basically, that's, that's the way that I started organizing things. Um, we just pulled them on there. Now, if you have your own learning management, uh, learning management system that you use in your school district, if you have something like Canvas or Schoology or any of those, um, Google Classroom is starting to become more and more like a learning management system, even though it's not technically. Um, but it does have some of the features that you could use to create that kind of thing. So um, I, that was one of the most important things for me there was organizing everything. So that's, that's step one, organize. So let's go on to step two, which is connect. This, this was something I, I alluded to a little bit earlier was I love how the web allows us to connect to virtually anybody in the world that has access to a, an internet connection and a device. And what's amazing is that we can, we can basically talk to them face to face through video chat tools like Skype and Google Hangouts and all of that. It makes me think back to the movie Back to the Future 2. If you've seen any of the Back to the Future series, I was a huge fan of all of those. And Back to the Future 2 was my favorite because they predicted what the future would look like. And it's funny because they predicted it all the way out to, what was it? Was it 2015? I want to say that it was 2015. And so, and it's, it's actually kind of eerie if you go back and look at those, um, look at that, that movie, they actually get some things right which is pretty scary. But they, they show a big screen in the, in the McFly household that serves as a video phone. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, that would be such, such a cool thing. I really hope that we get video phones at some point. And we basically do now. We do have, have through Skype and Google Hangouts and all that, we have the ability to do that. So, so I use that to, I, I leverage that tool to get my students connected to a class of, remember, high school Spanish students, to get them connected to a class of English language learners in Valencia, Spain. This is really one of the coolest things that I've gotten to do with my students in my entire career. And what we did was, and you can see the map here, this is us over in Indiana, and then this is where Valencia is. And so we span the entire Atlantic Ocean here, and then all the way over on the other side of the Iberian Peninsula to get to Valencia. And what we did was, we would get my students, on, it was Mondays usually, for about two months. Every Monday we would get two of my students onto an iPad and two of their students onto a laptop and we would connect by Skype. And we would have conversations. And so here's kind of what it, I want to get back to that slide in just a second. This, this is the class of uh, students in Valencia, Spain. And then up in the top left hand corner is my students. In this picture, we're actually having a mystery Skype call. And I can talk about those in a little bit here. But um, basically, 
we, we did it this way. We had 45 minute class periods. And so for the first 15 minutes of it, we would talk in English. And their teacher and my teacher, came, we came, to, came up with some discussion questions for them to talk about. So we would talk in English. My students would ask the questions in English. They would answer. And then they could give them a little critique on how their English is. And then for the next 15 minutes, they would swap. And they would say, we would say, OK, for the next 15 minutes, we're going to talk in Spanish. And so they would ask the questions in Spanish. My students would answer. And they would get help from real live native Spanish speakers in Spain that were their age, which was really cool. And so for the last 15 minutes, we would basically just let them hang out on Skype. And so they would talk in whatever language they wanted to. A lot of times it was English because the students in Spain had had several more years of English than my students had had in Spanish. And so a lot of times we talked in, um, in English. And they just got to ask each other questions like, I mean, what do you guys have for dinner? Or what do you like to do in your spare time? And some people look at that and they go, you know, you didn't have any learning objectives. You didn't have any discussion questions. Wasn't this just like a huge waste of time? But let me tell you, those 15 minutes were about the, they, those may have been the most worthwhile 15 minutes every week that they had in potentially in their entire, in their entire world languages classes for maybe even all three years. And here's why. In Indiana, um, where we live, it's real agricultural and real um, rural. And we have lots of farmers, and lots of farms, and lots of fields. And we have migrant workers that work the, in those fields. And a lot of them come from Central America. And so a lot of them more specifically come from Mexico. And so they come in, and there are some real negative stereotypes about them, which I hate. Um, a lot of times I hear people saying, oh, those, those Spanish speakers are up here. They're just up here to steal our jobs. And so as a Spanish teacher, I have fought and fought and fought and fought that stereotype. And nothing has come as close to changing kids' minds about people who speak Spanish as this particular experience has. I tried lecturing. I mean, if you try to lecture teenagers about something to get them to change their opinions, not the best way. <laughs> and I tried lecturing. I tried different activities. Nothing worked like this did. And so this is, this is I think, one of, the, one of the biggest game changing features for me anyway as far as uh, technology goes. Now, if you're interested in doing this kind of thing, one of the issues is the time difference. You have to be good with your time zones. And I have to tell you, I feel like I'm fairly time zone illiterate. Even though I live in Indiana and I'm about 20 minutes away from the Illinois state line, which crosses from Eastern time to Central time. And so the time zone has been sort of a, a big issue for me for a long time, and I still feel very time zone illiterate. I have to just look it up and check and double check and triple check. But we found out that our class started at 10 AM, and the students in Spain had afternoon school instead of morning school. And so they were, they were kind of rapid. They were in their last class at 4 o'clock. And so it worked just perfectly for us. So if you decide that you want to do this, make sure that you have your time zones all figured out. And this was obviously one of the biggest things, one of the biggest features of this was the way that it changed my students' view of the world. Nothing else worked quite like this did. So um, one of the things that, one of the links that we have in the live binder, actually a couple of them relate to this, but one of them goes directly to the Skype in the Classroom website. And what that is, is it's a site where you can either, it, it's almost like a bulletin board where you can post lessons that you want to do, or you can browse lessons that other teachers want to do that involve Skype. And so that's, that's how I found my teacher from Valencia, Spain. And so what you can do is you can go in there and post your own idea, or you can go find somebody else that either has the exact same idea as you, or do what I did. I found, I found somebody from the part of the world that I wanted to connect with. And I read her lesson, and I thought, no, oh, that's not exactly what I want to do. And so I contacted her and I said, OK, you want to do this. I want to do this. Can we meet in the middle? And she said yes. And so I had, and I also have to say that I had no idea what in the world I was doing with this. I had never connected with anybody before in Skype. I mean, in my own state, in my own country, I mean, let alone across the 
across the globe, across the Atlantic Ocean. And so we just kind of kind of made it up as we as we went. We knew what our learning objectives were. We knew what we wanted our kids to get out of it. And so we just worked together and just kind of created it. So my my encouragement to you is that if you want to try this, if you think that this would be a game changer for your kids, don't let your lack of experience keep you from doing it. Just jump right in there and give it a shot. And honestly, even if it blows up in your face, I've found that when things blow up in my face and I'm trying something different with my students, they're usually very appreciative to me of actually trying something different. So, in fact, I want to show you real quick um, just a little video clip. This, these were some of the reactions of my, uh, of my students. I think you've learned, like, we've learned a lot from it, like, just the other cultures and getting able to talk to someone, like, a lot yeah. of people don't have the opportunity to, like, travel to different places, so it's kind of like that. Um, it's, it's pretty cool because, because, like, they are obviously in Spain, and it's, it's, a, it's pretty awesome to actually talk to people that is their native language, I and mean, I feel that, like, it helps a lot. With, uh, with our Spanish speaking abilities. So if you want to see the rest of that video, uh, they, they go on to say, you know, it says, has it helped with your Spanish? Um, what did you think of the experience and all of that? And so those are, those are actually my students that, that connected with these students in Spain. And so, um, so yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully that's, that's something that you'll, you'll want to check out. So, so anyway, we talked about organizing with a class website. We talked about connecting with things like um, Skype and Google Hangouts. And you don't even have to use Skype and Google Hangouts. One part of our activities that we did together was we shared uh, Google Documents. So if you have Google Apps or if you're, you're whatever your role is in education, if you have Office 365 or, I mean, there's lots of ways that you can get everybody in the same collaborative space. I mean, Padlet is a great example of that too. Um, Padlet is kind of like a, it's kind of like a, an online cork board that you can stick um, post-it notes to. And so, I mean, getting, if you connect your class with somebody else, you know, across the world or across your, your country or state or whatever, that could be your collaborative space. And so it doesn't even have to be with video chat, but I found that that had the most impact personally. So, okay, so that's that. And then we're going to go to collaborate. Speaking of, see the segue I just did there? So speaking of um, Google Apps, Google Documents, Google Slides, and that kind of thing, that has been a huge game changer for me. I am a Google certified teacher. Actually, I think the, the accurate term now is Google certified innovator, um, which means that I've gone through some training that Google's put on. And honestly, the best training that I've had has just been in my classroom, working with my students and trying to come up with different things. And so. I wanted to show you a couple of ways that my students collaborate with each other and collaborate, you know, can go beyond the four walls of the classroom um, using Google Apps. And so like I was saying earlier, some of these things can play over very easily to Office 365 and then with some other Web 2.0 tools. And so here's the first one that I want to show you is a shared presentation. This is something that's really basic but has been become really a go-to tool for me. And so here's basically what it is. This is an example one that I used in a training with a, a high school. And so what I do is I create a slide presentation like this. And I share it with my students. Now for me, that meant putting a link into Google Classroom. That made it really easy. Um, another way that you can do that is by creating a Today's Meet Room. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab the link. See right here, I'm going to copy the link to this. You want to make sure that it's anyone with the link can edit so that your students can actually come in and make changes on those slides. And what I'll also do sometimes is I'll create a Today's Meet Room. So we're going to go todaysmeet.com. I would create a room and on it, if you're not familiar with Today's Meet, you're going to see what it's all about here in just a second. Usually I would create one and use that exact same room the rest of the, or the entire year. I'm going to call this one Classroom 2.0 and open it up. And so see, it basically creates like this little private chat room for you. And so what I could do is I could create one of those uh, slide presentations like this one right here, get the link, and I could just drop the link in right here. See, there's a clickable link right there. So I could just tell my students, okay, go to todaysmeet.com slash classroom20. 
and click on that link. And then they would all come right into this, this uh, presentation. And so what I'll do is I'll give everybody a number. Now, last year, the way I had it set up was I had a number taped to the back of all of their uh, seats at their desks. And so everybody already had a number. But before I did that, I just went, through, went down the rows and said, okay, you're one, you're two, you're three, you're four, so on and so forth. And we'd get everybody a slide. And so what's great about this is that it gives everybody a little bit of digital real estate to do their work. And so usually what I would say is put your name up in the title like I did here, and then I would give them some sort of activity to do. So in this case, I had to, um, my students in this case were high school teachers. I was teaching them about this. And I said, I want you to write a little bit about your ideal vacation destination. And then I told them, because teachers are no different than students and they're always looking for a little leg up. And I said, you get bonus points if you add a picture and or a link to your slide. And I was glad no, but none of them asked what bonus points would earn them because I really don't know. <laughs> but sometimes, even when you say that, if you give them an opportunity to go above and beyond, then some of them will take it. And so um, here's what we got was we had, you know, imagine these being my, um, my students. See, this one wrote in Spanish. That got bonus points for me. And so I gave them a couple of minutes, and we had a lot of them that would actually write. Some of them actually were able to pull in some pictures. And I would have my students do this. Wow, going to Epcot without their kids. That would be pretty cool, actually. If you've ever been to Epcot, I think, you know, me being sort of a geography geek, I think that would be a lot of fun. There's another one with pictures. And so you can see how this could work. And so I'm going to go ahead and jump back off of this. And so um, the way that I, I really liked using this was I would give them a slide and I would just give them some sort of activity. Like imagine that we're going to study Costa Rica. And so I would say go out on the web, do some basic internet research, and find me three interesting facts about Costa Rica. And then add a picture. And then just pull all that in from the web. And so, and I said they have to actually be real interesting facts and not just like what the gross domestic product is, what's the, whatever the first thing is you can find in Wikipedia. And so they would go and do that. And the amazing thing about this was that we would have basically a crowdsourced 20 slide presentation with, six, if they did three facts, 20 times three is 60, with 60 facts about Costa Rica that were interesting to the students and 20 pictures. And my students got so good at it that they could pull all that information in in a matter of five minutes. It would have taken me more than an hour to pull together 60 facts, 20 pictures, and to make them interesting. But that's, that's one way that you can use the power of the crowd, the power of the group to create something interesting. And so that's a shared presentation. And the other thing I wanted to show you real quick was um, the idea of graphic organizers. And if you do Google Apps and you've never heard of Google Drawings before, um, this is actually one of my favorite of the Google Apps. And so this is what Google Drawings looks like. It basically gives you a blank page. And you can add all these different shapes to it. You can add text boxes to it. You can add images. I mean, there's all these different things, lines and all of this. And so it's a, it is really a very um, flexible tool to use. And one way that I, I like to use it is to create graphic organizers. So I set it up like this. And then I'll have my students go to, and I'll, I'll set the sharing for anyone with the link can view. This one says edit because I had it so that um, so that teachers could come in and practice on the same one. But I can make it anyone with the link can view. The students are able to come in, and then they can go make a copy of it using file make a copy. Hopefully you can see that on your screen. And then they make a copy of it into their own Google Drive, and then they can go through and do whatever it is that the graphic organizer asks them to do. In this case, this is an, an activity called hexagonal thinking, and it uses all these little hexagons. And you're supposed to try to fit them together, and then all of these ideas are supposed to be linked in some way. Um, so in this one it says tennis. And then tennis is supposed to be linked to baseball and football. Football is linked to <laughs> Alabama, Crimson Tide, right? They're huge on their football, linked to games. Baseball is also linked to games. Baseball, I, baseball, I guess, is linked to football because it's sports. And so anyway, that's how that particular uh, graphic organizer works. And so um, you can either have one student work on this. And it, it's almost like having virtual manipulatives that they can go in and move around. 
Um, or you could have a group of two or a group of three work together in the same collaborative space. And it's really neat to see kids work together in a digital space because they may be standing or sitting shoulder to shoulder, but they're all working together in this one document. So to hear them talk about, oh, we need this over here. Okay, well, I'll go find a picture. I'll go search the Creative Commons um, image search and find something. Okay, well, while you're doing that, I'm going to start putting in the title and, I mean, just to hear them talk and work together and just the teamwork and the problem solving skills that go into that I think is great. And that's, that's something that you can do by collaborating, working together in this, in this collaborative space. So, so there you have it. Those are three ways that I think you can ditch your textbooks and, um, and do things maybe a little bit differently than that traditional classroom that we were talking about at the beginning. So number one was organize by creating a class website. Number two was connect through collaborative tools like Skype and Google Hangouts. And three is collaborate using Google Apps. Those are three big ones for that, that I've used. And, and Peggy has been gracious enough to drop in a link here. I actually want to show that to you real quick. Um, that is the, my graphic organizers page. And so I'm going to show that to you real fast. If you think that you would like to try creating or try using these graphic organizers, and you don't want to take the time to create them yourself, I wrote this blog post and created 15 different kinds of graphic organizers um, using Google Drawings and then just linked to them. So if you want to use, see if I can get this to close real quick. If you want to make a Venn diagram, a KWL, a timeline, a cause and effect change, these are all different ones that I've already created. You can see little thumbnails of what they look like here then you can go straight into these and make a copy of it into your own Google Drive and then have students work on it. And so, and you can see over here by the social sharing that this has been a very popular post. Um, it's gotten more than 700 tweets, more than 700 shares on Google Plus and all of that. And so um, you can use some of mine or you can create your own from scratch, which is kind of nice. So I also did want to, you know what, I do want to share with you really fast. I know I keep bringing up other things. Um, let's see if I can, no, you know what, if you go to my, my website, uh, if you're looking for more great ideas, I have a free ebook available on my website. So if you go to ditchthattextbook.com, then that was what that little pop-up window was, or you can find it along the right side of the website. I have a free ebook called 101 Practical Ways to Ditch That Textbook. And so this this uh, ebook is just a big collection of ideas that I've pulled together of how to use technology to get creativity into the classroom, just to think things differently, think through things differently in the classroom. And so if you're interested in checking that free ebook out, again, like I said, it is free. Uh, you put your email address and your name in there and it delivers it right into your inbox so you can go check it out. So I think that brings us to the end of my part of the presentation. And if we're ready to jump into the questions and answers, I am ready to do that. Great, Matt. Here's how to contact, contact Matt. I did collect some questions, so let me go towards the top. Um, this one was about Weebly. Can it be blocked? So students have to sign in? You know, I think that uh, from my experience with Weebly, I've never done that. My site has always been totally public. Mm -hmm. um, here, here are my, here's sort of my take on that. I think that there is a premium option where it's password protected and you can sign in with a password. But you know, honestly, when I put my class website out there, I thought, if other people come in and get some ideas based off of my website, or if other people want to learn about Spanish off of my website, then that's great, and mm -hmm. I'm all for that. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I just couldn't think of a reason why I'd want a password protected or, or make it private. Right, yeah, and private pages, password protected pages are part of Google Pro. Uh, child privacy was the, was the issue. Okay, as as, all right, fair enough. Uh, the re the que reason for the question. Yeah. And you could also get around, around that, I think, by you know, doing the same thing that a lot of schools do is if you want to limit that 
identifying information of students or um, you know, by just going down to first names or initials or whatever, that could work. Um, I've seen some people who will post pictures and then they'll put mm -hmm. some sort of little icon over the students' faces so that they're not identified. So there are, there are other ways to get around that too. Or not posting full names. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. How does Weebly compare to Google Classroom? Ah, okay, that's a good question. They are they are totally separate tools. Um, here's what I like about Google Classroom is that you're able to um, assign work. Students can go out and work on the work using Google Apps like documents or slides or whatever. They can turn it in and it can all be graded all within Google Classroom. You don't need any other tools to do that. And even with some of the new features, you can even, like as of this fall, you can go in and you can ask a question. Just ask a simple question and use it almost like a discussion board right there in Classroom. And so as more and more features come in, it becomes, I mean, more robust and there's more that you can do. Now, Weebly, I think, has an advantage in that it's more visual, more spatial. You can, you can move things around and design a little bit better. You can pull in pictures. You have more control over the way that it looks. So if I were starting all over right now, um, I might do everything in Google Classroom. But I might mm -hmm. also have a Weebly site where I can design things a little bit more the way that I want. So two, they're kind of two separate tools in my opinion. Okay. You talked about the time difference, um, so I think we've already taken care of that question. Mm -hmm. uh, what about voice comments in Google Apps for asynchronous oral conversations? Ooh. Somebody else mentioned VoiceThread as well. Yeah, yeah, VoiceThread is great. Um, I know that we do have um, the the voice comments is, is a newer feature to um, to documents. I think I haven't played with it very much, but I think it's got an awful lot of upside, and it seems like it's pretty easy to do. Um, I like that for a couple of reasons. It's it's kind of like the whole Voxer phenomenon that is so big in education right now is that you get to actually hear people's voices. You can hear the inflection in their voices, and so. It's kind of like with text messaging. I get so frustrated with text messaging sometimes because you can't, you can't read the tone, intonation of somebody's voice in a text message. And so if you use those, right. those voice messages, that would be neat. I think it would be even cooler if you brought in people from outside of your class and you were able to hear their voices. I think that would be great. And then the other thing that I think is good about that is if students turn in work and then they can hear your voice uh, talking to them about what they need to do instead of just text because, again, so much gets lost in um, communication with just the text-based communication. So I think it's got an awful lot of upside and it's, it's, it sounds great to me. And I can even see over in the chat that there are some other, um, some other things. Uh, Audio Dropbox is clear, C-L-E-A-R. That's out of a, a tool that I think is geared more towards uh, foreign language teachers out of Michigan State, but anybody can use it. That one works. Um, I mean, Kaizena is one that has been around for a long time that adds audio uh, comments. I don't know how that compares to the audio, um, you know, the, the audio comments that are native to Google Apps now. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, those are those are all good suggestions too. So, and thank you, Sherry, for dropping that link in. That was good. How much tech was available to your students when you started, and has it increased since you started? And oh. I think this is individual tech. Yeah. Right. Oh my goodness. Um, right. Let me tell yeah. you about the and iPads and tablets, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. The question. Okay. Um, the technology in my classroom when I first started. I remember this was back in. Um, I think 2004 was my first year teaching. Um, I had, I didn't even have a projector at that point. Um, no, at some point during that first year, the English teacher across the hall from me was about to retire and he had an LCD projector, which was a big deal and not all the classes had them at the, that time. And he just finally decided that, because what he wanted to do was take all of his notes from trans overhead transparencies and just switch them over to PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. And so I mean that's a, that's a pretty 
pretty clear um, example of substitution in the SAMR model, mm -hmm. I think. And yep. uh, he just decided that it wasn't worth all the time, and so he's, he asked me if I wanted it. And I said yes before he could change his mind and took mm -hmm. it and hook it up in my classroom so he couldn't take it back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I was running off of my multimedia cart that I would pull out for a while um, with the DVD player and the VCR and a uh, cord for my laptop. And since then, I, I had, I think, six desktop computers at the back of my class at one point. Just last year, I got a cart of Chromebooks. And so we're not totally one-to-one. -one. Um, students leave the devices in the classrooms, but that was a game changer just for everybody to be able to have that right in front of them. Um, just sure. To, yeah, it, it really, I mean, having Google Classroom and being able to do so much with Google Apps really changed the, the way that I taught in that way. Absolutely. Um, this person is interested in anyone's comment on becoming Google certified as a teacher. The time investment, the value, the level of difficulty, that kind of thing. Okay. And yeah, if anybody else is and would like to, you know, put comments over in the chat, that's that would be great. I will tell you from my personal experience, um, I went through Google Teacher Academy just uh, last December. Um, it's a very competitive process. I know that a lot of times whenever the the applications go out, there are hundreds of people that apply for it, and mm -hmm. usually there are 50 slots, and you have to pay for your own transportation to get there. The training is free, and um, I think for me, the biggest part of it wasn't, it wasn't so much learning about Google tools because I sort of knew about Google Apps. I, I did learn some new things that I didn't know before, but the connections to the other teachers, the validation that what you're doing is, is great, and um, the, the encouragement to really think big and to be able to try to make a change in, in education in general, especially in your school, those were the big things that I got out of it. And so um, I, I think it was a great process and I think anybody who's bought into using Google in the classroom, if you're able to apply and make it to one of these, I don't think that you'll be disappointed. Great. Have you or any the others in the room used audio and video in Canvas for world languages or other disciplines? Yeah, that would be Canvas, the learning management system. Yeah, the, Good question. the LMS, yep. Yeah. Because I know, I've, I've seen a couple of demos for Canvas and I know that they're um, audio and video capabilities really are pretty well um, developed, and we've mm -hmm. never had Canvas at my at my school, so I've never gotten to play with it. So, oh yeah, <laughs> not Canva. It <laughs> not is easy Canva. to get those confused. That's a good point, Peggy. <laughs> right. Canva is yeah. great too. You can make some really good-looking presentation slides using Canva, among right. other things. The the school that I'm I'm teaching at virtually uses Canvas now, and I have not use the audio recording much because I'm teaching algebra at the moment. So that's not foreign language. <laughs> to some people it is a foreign language. Oh, well, yeah. To some people it is. Correct. I'm, yes. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Algebra <laughs> is, is quite foreign. Yep. Yes. I actually have some, some students that think that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have ideas on convincing the teachers who just want to put in their hours uh, in school, how to be inventive. Um, some want a textbook to, to avoid the extra time investment. Yeah, you know, I've I've presented and worked with presented to and worked with a lot of teachers and a lot of different parts of their career, from the brand new ones to the ones that are close to retirement. And you know, I'm I'm very much of the belief that there's mm -hmm. there's only some. We can, we can provide them with tools, we can provide them with ideas, mm -hmm. and we can show them what has worked for us, but it's kind of like the old uh, proverbial lead a horse to water. I mean, there's nothing that we can do to make them drink. There's nothing that we can do Correct. to make them become innovative and to make them want. That, that is one thing that trainers and presenters and um, people like that just cannot do. And so I honestly think that, the, in my opinion, um, in my experience, the best way to get teachers on fire about making change is seeing the change happen in other people's classrooms. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a real encouragement, I think, to 
classroom teachers, sometimes we say, oh, I'm just a teacher, I just have my own classroom. But if, if you start to do neat, innovative things and really start to make a change in your classroom and you let other people know about it, especially in your own building, also you know, out on social media and, and everything, that I think is a huge change maker. Um, makes me think of that Margaret Mead quote about um, a group of committed citizens is the only thing that has changed the world. I'm paraphrasing. Um, I think that's so true in education too. As a Google certified teacher, what do you think of Google Classroom? Ah, Google Classroom. I love it. Um, it is not, <laughs> I mentioned this earlier, I'll say it again, it is not a full-fledged learning management system. It's not intended mm -hmm. to be and it isn't, but um, when I didn't have Google Classroom before, I was using these, um, these scripts that would allow my students to have shared folders called G class folders. Uh, some of you may have used it before. And it was not as easy to get things, to share things between teachers and students. Um, it did make it easier. And probably if you've worked with Google Apps before, you have looked at the mile long list of um, <laughs> documents that were shared with you by your students and wondered how in the world am I going to find anything in all of this. Um, Google Classroom is just so good at being simple. I mean, it is. It's, re it's really simple and on purpose it's simple. And it just does what teachers need, you, need to do. And that is assign work, collect work, grade work, return work. And it does that, that really well. I mean, could it have more features? Everybody is always coming up with things that it wish, they wish that it would do. But right now what it does, I think it does very simply. It, I think it was a focus on more teaching and less teching, <laughs> more teach, mm -hmm. less tech, and, and it, it does that really well, I think. How, rece how receptive were the administrators to the ditching idea? Uh, Are they happier with it now that you've become widely known? Um, let's see. I always get that question. I've been very <laughs> blessed to have, um, uh, to have principals that were supportive of the idea. Um, I'm, I'm glad that with them, they were more focused on what's good teaching and learning and what's going to help the kids more and not so much mm -hmm. on being stuck on one tool, in that case being the textbook. So I haven't had an administrator tell me, you know what, we adopted these textbooks, you better use them, you better teach out of them. And so thankfully that's, that's good. And as far as the widely known part, um, that really, honestly, in my building has had zero effect on it whatsoever. <laughs> that's big use, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that, that whole, well, yeah, I, it, it really hasn't had any, any effect on it. I'm, I'm having to change minds just as much as anybody else does. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, those were all the questions I caught in the chat as Great. well as some that, that you found yeah. towards the end here. It's funny that Patty, you said the prophet is not a hero in his hometown. I almost said that and I held back. That's <laughs> funny. That was like right on the tip of my tongue and then I didn't end up saying it. Mm -hmm. But you, you articulated it better than I could. Thanks so much, Matt. My we'll pleasure. go ahead and wrap up. Actually, I think I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy for the upcoming shows. Thank you so much, Matt. That was excellent. Way more than we even anticipated when we knew that you were going to be talking about tips from Ditch That Textbook. So everyone's going to definitely want to share out this recording as soon as it's published. We hope all of you will come back every week to join us for the great uh, speakers and sessions we have planned for you. Next Saturday, we're going to be doing a preview of the upcoming K-12 online conference. And and all of the conference organizers are going to be there. And they'll be telling you about the keynote speakers in every strand and all of their presenters. So it's a great way in a short amount of time to find out all about the conference. And the fabulous thing about that conference is it's asynchronous. So you don't have to join at a certain time. You can watch those recordings whenever, once they are uploaded. Then on September 26th, we have Matt Hartman coming to tell us all about eCyber Mission. That's new to a lot of us, so can't wait for that. And October 3rd, we're going to have a great show on Buncee with a couple of the Buncee teacher ambassadors. October 10th, we're going to be featuring Minecraft EDU. 
and October 17th. We're going to have a great session with Jennifer Garcia, and we think it's going to be all about digital storytelling with iPads and green screens and do ink. And then we won't have a show on October 24th because that's the Denfall Virtual Conference. We hope you'll all plan to go to that. It's always an excellent free virtual conference. And October 31st, we'll be having Marcy Hebert as our October featured teacher, and she's going to be sharing about maker spaces. So I hope you'll come back and join us for those. And also just want to remind you that Global Collaboration Day is coming up this next week, Thursday, September 17th, a fabulous day with lots of events going on around the world. And all you have to do is go to that site and check out what's being offered. You can even offer your own um, activities and people can come and join you. So go to that link and uh, see what's coming up and you're going to be so excited to see that. And now I'll turn it back to you, Lori. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest endeavor. He's gathered all of his PD resources in one place. Um, and this also includes the Host Your Own Webinar series. So you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room as, as long as you make your presentation public, the room's free. You can also nominate a featured teacher at this link, as well as nominate yourself for the featured teacher of the month like Matt was today. As you exit the show, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should pop up in your browser. You can also take this link. The chat box will also have the log here shortly, uh, as well as on the resource tab for Classroom 2.0 Live for each of the month's live binders. The link is for the survey is in there as well. There's the survey. Inside the survey at the end, you can request a professional development cer certificate. This will print out with your name, which is new in the past few months. Please make sure when you do make this request, though, that you use a personal email address for the certificate. This tends to be blocked from school email clients. All the video recordings and audio recordings are in iTunes U collection, so that's another way to catch up on sessions that you might have missed, as well as the RSS feed, including the full recordings that you can get at the Classroom 2.0 Live site. Again, special thanks to Matt Miller, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution. Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who partic participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming. <laughs>